Texas Neosho County Community College. You're listening to Chapter 7, Lecture of Computer Concepts and Applications, CSIS 100. In Chapter 6, we learned how to indent text and change line and paragraph spacing. In Chapter 7, we're going to concentrate on enhancing documents with special features. There are several features in Word that allow you to add visual appeal. You can organize information or format a document for a special purpose, such as a research paper. Word provides different views in which to work and navigate a document and includes collaborative tools, such as comments for working on a document with other people. There are also several resume and cover letter templates that are available in Word to help you build these important job search documents. Please turn over to page 188 in your textbook and let's begin with chapter 7. The first skill that's introduced is how to insert, edit, and label images in a document. You might notice that there are several files that you'll need for this exercise. Please keep in mind that your textbook did come with a student resource CD that has all of the files available on it. Or, on Inside in C, under each assignment type, you'll notice that there is a list of files that you can save for each assignment, making it easy and quick for you to download the necessary documents that you need. The first document that we're going to open is called the Insola Summary Addictions Course. Please take a moment and open up this file. Once you open up the file, it's always important to resave it so you don't overwrite the original. You'll want to resave the file to your flash drive or a location on your desktop or your computer of where you're saving all of your finished documents at. We're going to save this file as in Sola Summary underscore your last name. This is a one page document that has a uh, description of the insula, which is a part of the brain. If you scroll down through the document, you'll notice that it's a short three paragraph summary. We're going to position the insertion point at the beginning of the first paragraph of text. Next, we're going to insert a, a photo uh, at the top of this paragraph. To do so, let's go ahead and select on the insert ribbon up at the top and you'll notice that there is an illustrations category. Under illustrations, you can choose to insert a picture, and this is something that you would have saved to your computer, clip art, which comes with Microsoft Office, shapes, smart art, a chart, or a screenshot. Those are the options for the insert menu uh, for the illustration category. If you're using 2013, you'll notice that there's a new button up at the top under illustrations called online pictures that you can select from. We're going to select the clip art gallery for 2010. Under the clip art gallery, on the right hand side, the clip art navigation pane will open. We're going to search for the word scientist. We also want to change our results so they're only photographs and not illustrations, videos, or audio. Also, make sure that you have the check mark uh, selected that states include office.com content and then select the go. You'll see several pictures that will start to come up depending on your internet connection. It does not matter which scientist photo that you choose for this experiment. Choose one of your choice and go ahead and select it one time to insert the picture onto the page. Once you have inserted the picture, you'll notice that there are sizing handles that surround the photo. On each side, there are small white dots and in the center there are white squares. This allows you to resize the photo by selecting a corner and dragging in. You can also change the layout of this picture. By looking up at the top on the ribbon bar, you'll also notice that there is a new ribbon called the Picture Tools. 
Under picture tools on the right hand side, we have an option for positioning as well as wrapping text. There are six options to wrap text, including square, tight, through, top and bottom, and then behind or in front of. If you move your mouse over these options, it will show you in the document what the photo looks like. Let's select square. You can also select positioning of your, of your picture. You can tell it to wrap the text to the left or to the center or to the right. Let's select the right option. Then go ahead and move your image down into the document and you'll notice how the text is now wrapped around the picture. I am going to go ahead and resize it a bit using my ruler and if you do not have the ruler turned on you can uh, select the ruler by choosing the view and then selecting the ruler checkbox at the top. Let's take a moment and just resize this uh, image to be about three and a half inches wide. And then let's fit it so it goes to the very top of where the uh, text begins. And as you move the picture, you'll notice the text snapping around the image. Next, we're going to insert another image that has been saved to your student data files. And once again, you can use your CD or download them from the assignment area on Inside NC. Let's put our cursor in front of the second paragraph, beginning with if scientists could alter how the insula works. From here, we're going to insert a picture called USC Photo. We're going to go back to insert, but instead of choosing clip art this time, we will select the picture icon locate your student data files and find the USC photo. Select insert. Now that we have the photo inserted, we can also choose to resize this image as we did with the previous one. I'm just going to decrease the size to about three inches. All right, with the picture still selected, I'm also going to change the wrap text to square, as we did previously, and position it towards the left of the second paragraph. There are some formatting options in Microsoft Word that you can use as well, called picture styles. And I remember when this first came out, it was very popular still is popular. Up at the top under picture tools you see the format options and if you select the chevron to go ahead and launch the dialog box you'll see the different formatting features that are available. If you move your mouse over these formatting styles your picture will automatically be altered so you can see what the style looks like as you move your mouse over them. The textbook would like us to choose the soft edge rectangle, the sixth option in the picture styles group. I'm at the top of page 191 and now we're going to work with entering a caption for a picture. We still have the picture selected here in the second paragraph. Now we're going to insert a caption by selecting the references ribbon up at the top. Then select insert caption. This is the dialog box for the caption tool. At the caption dialog box, we're going to put the insertion point inside of the caption text box and we will type insula research is being done at the University of Southern California. Notice that there are other labels that you can include as well, including an equation, a figure, or a table. We'll leave it set to figure. 
Notice position can be above or below. Again, we'll leave it with the default that's set to below. Then select OK. And then you'll notice the caption is placed directly underneath the picture. I'm going to save our document by doing Control S for a quick save. Turning over to page 192, we're now going to add borders and shading and then insert a text box. Since we still have the insole of summary open, we won't need to go and reopen it. So let's go to the Home tab. And then let's put our cursor at the very top of the page. We're going to select the first two lines of the document that are the title and the subtitle. Now we're going to apply a border that will be applied around just this text. The border option is found to the left of the styles. From here, we're going to tap on the outside borders. Notice how the border is now applied just to the top two lines of the text. If you've deselected it, please go ahead and reselect the text. Next, we're going to use shading in our uh, border area. The shading button is, is, can be found under the paragraph group. It's identified by a paint bucket. Notice if you move your mouse over some of the colors, it will reflect into the document. We're going to select an orange accent, which is the 80% option. Now you can deselect your text by selecting the text below. We can also apply a page border to our, um, our document. And again, if you're using 2013, you'll notice that the page border will be under the design tab. In 2010, the page border is found under page layout. We're going to select the page border icon in the middle of this ribbon. Here, we can change the width and the color of our page border. We're going to select a width of one and a half points from the drop down list towards the bottom. And then select OK. And we should have probably selected the border option first. So let's do that again. Select page border, one and a half point, then we forgot to choose what setting we wanted. Let's choose the shadow setting, then select OK. Now we have a nice page border that encumbrances the entire document. Inserting text inside a text box is a way to draw the reader's attention to an important quote or point in a document. A quote inside a text box is called a pull quote. We're going to position our insertion point at the very end of the document. Let's select from the insert menu the text box option. Notice there are several styles of text boxes that you can select from. Let's scroll down to the very bottom and select the one. There are actually several in this area. I'll have you choose one that you like. It doesn't matter which text box you choose. Choose a style that you like. Notice the text box has, has sizing handles just like a picture does, which allows you to resize and make the text box smaller or larger depending on uh, where you want, would like it displayed. Inside of the text box, let's type in the text that is found on page 193. Now, 
let's resize our text box so it will fit on the top of uh, our document. just resizing it so it fits into one area. Please resize your text box so it fits at the bottom of the page. From here, we'll save our document. This is the first document that you will submit for credit on Inside NC. We will not be using this document again. Please be sure to save as in Sola Summary with your last name. On page 194 of your textbook, we begin to learn about inserting tables. Tables are used to organize and present data in columns and rows. Text is typed within a table cell, which is a rectangular box that is the intersection of a column and a row. We can also create a new table using quick tables, which are simply predefined. To begin, we'll open a document called Res Mill Plans. This will be found in your student data files on the CD, or you can use the uh, Inside and C assignment to download those files. Res Mill Plans. And once we have the file open, let's resave it to include your last name at the end. Turn with me to page 194 and follow along with step number three. We're going to position the insertion point at the left margin in the blank line below the subheading of mill plans with descriptions. This is where we're going to place our table. Inserting a table can be found under the insert menu and then select table. You'll notice that there is a grid that appears, and if you select by just dragging your mouse over, you'll notice the table automatically inserts into your document. We're going to insert a 3 by 2 table, which is 3 columns and 2 rows. While the table inserts into our document, we are now ready to begin typing text within the table. So let's put our cursor in the first cell of the table and type in the text meal plan name. Using the tab key will take you to the next cell where we can type in cost and then description. Please continue the process for the second row by typing in the text found on page 194. You'll also want to take time to press the tab key and that will insert a new row. The rest of the table information can be found on the top of page 195. Please take a few minutes and type in the remaining table information. Once you've completed with your table information, now we're ready to position our insertion point at the left margin in the blank line below the subheading Mill Plan Fund Allocations. Here we're going to insert another table that is a 5 by 5. Instead of choosing from the grid under the insert menu, we're going to select an insert table dialog box. Select insert. From the insert tab, just select insert table from the top and then select insert table which is directly underneath the grid. Here, you receive a dialog box that asks you how many columns and how many rows you'd like. 
please change your column number to 5 and your row number to 5 and press OK. The table information can be found at the bottom of page 195. Please take a few minutes and type in the information found on the bottom of page 195. Once you have your table information typed in, please save your table. At any time you need more time to complete the information in these two tables, feel free to pause the video and continue typing. Moving over to page 196, we're now going to design these tables to have some color to them as well as border styles. Let's position our insertion point at any table cell within the first table. So just place your insertion point somewhere within this table. You'll notice that they have uh, two new toolbars up at the top called Design and Layout, which are both found under the Table Tools ribbon. There are several styles to select from under Design. In fact, you can just move your mouse over a few of them. It'll show you what the outcome would be. Let's choose the chevron to open up all of the styles. Look for Grid Table 4, Accent 2, which is the third option in the fourth row. If you apply that style, you'll see the change that takes place instantly. Let's choose a different style. Continue going through each of the styles until you find one that you like. Once you have selected a style, notice the formatting applied to the column headings and text in the first column. Shading applies to every other row, which makes it easier for the data to be read. This is often referred to as banded rows, which is found on page 196. If you did not want the first column to be highlighted or formatted separately, you could select the checkbox in the top left corner where it says header row, and by deselecting that option, the heading row will not be, select, uh, be uh, formatted. I'm going to go ahead and turn that feature back on. You can also select first column to take the bold off of the first column. Moving over to page 197 at the top of the page, it would like us to select the heading columns in the first row of the table. To do that, I'm going to use the white mouse on the far left hand side and select one time to click on the entire row. From here, if I move my mouse slightly above it, you'll notice I have the mini toolbar displayed. From here, I can select what kind of shading I want for the top of my bar. Choose a shading style that matches your overall theme. Next, we're going to practice with inserting and deleting columns and rows. Buttons in Rows and Columns group of the Table Tools Layout tab are used to insert or delete columns or rows. We will position the insertion point within a table cell, select multiple rows or columns or select the entire table, and then we'll practice with deleting cells, a column, a row, or the table. First, let's position the insertion point within any table cell in the third row of the table, beginning with the word light. From here, we're going to select to delete this row. To delete the row, we're going to select the Layout ribbon from the top. Under Rows and Columns, you'll notice that there is a Delete option, Insert, to above or below, or to left to right. We're going to select the Delete, and then select Delete Row. Now you'll notice that the Light Meal Plan name has been deleted. Next, let's position the insertion point with any table cell within the third row of the second table. <clears throat> and we will also delete out the light row in the mill plan fund allocations table. Now our tables are identical. Next, we're going to create a new column that will be between the cost and description columns. 
first, let's put the position of the insertion point within any table cell in the last column within the first table. Then we're going to insert a row, uh, excuse me, a column to the left. For this column, this will be called daily spending. Notice when we type in the text, the formatting remains consistent with the rest of the table. Let's type the values in as indicated on the bottom of page 197. And since I have typed in minimum twice, I'm going to go ahead and delete out this row. And if you typed it twice, you'll want to delete out your row as well. For some reason, I had minimum in there two times. You want it to be just one time. So we have a minimum, full, and plus mill plan. Over on page 198, we'll now modify column width and alignment and merge cells. <clears throat> Let's position the insertion point within any table cell in the second column of the first table. From here, we're going to change the width of the uh, column. To do so, we will select the width option at the very top and here we have uh, it set at 1.66 inches. Let's increase its value to 2.3. Since the insertion point is still positioned within the last column of the first table, from here, we'll align to the top left button in the alignment group. Let's select the first column in the first table, and let's tap or click on the Align Center button in the Alignment group. Let's also choose the Center option within the cell. Let's repeat the steps for all of the columns. then the last column will be aligned to the left. Now we're ready to format the second table. Position the insertion point within any table cell in the first row of the second table. And from here, we're going to select to insert above in the rows and columns group. After we have created a new row, we are now ready to merge these cells together to make a, a title. The Merge Cells feature is found at the top in the midsection of the layout ribbon. Now, let's type in the text that's found on the top of page 199, which is breakdown of meal plan cost by fund. Select the column headings and all of the values in columns two, three, and four. Let's align this text to the center. <clears throat> now let's place our insertion point in any table cell in the second table and from here we're going to select the entire table. An easy way to do that is to select the four arrow uh, crosshair at the very top left of the table or you can go to the very top left of the ribbon and select choose the select option and choose select table to select it. We are going to remove the borders from this table. To do so, let's select the design tab <coughs> under borders. Let's select no border. Notice it's still going to give us a dotted line, a grid, to know where the rows and columns uh, are at. 
let's select the paragraph below the table to deselect it and apply the heading to style to our title. Let's also center the breakdown of meal plan cost by fund. Let's save. On page 200, we begin to learn a new skill, which is how to change page layout options. By default, new documents in Word are set up for a letter size page. Portrait means the orientation that the text on the page is vertical. <clears throat> Landscape means that the orientation then is from left to right. Now that we have saved this file, we're going to open a new file called Child Lit Book Report. This file will be the second file that will be uploaded uh, on Inside and C. Please take a moment and open the file called Child Lit Book Report either located on your student data files CD or on the assignment area for Inside and C. Once you have the, the file open, please resave it to include your last name at the end of the file name. This is a two-page document. The first page gives a brief description of a book by Dr. Seuss, The Butter Battle Book. And as I scroll down, it gives some information about the author as well as the story. Let's select the page Layout tab. From here, we can change the orientation of our page. If you select orientation, you'll notice that we have the portrait option or the landscape option. I'm going to change it to landscape. Notice the width of the page is extended and the page is now wider than it is tall. You can slide or scroll down to view the document in landscape orientation. Please put your insertion point at the very top of the document and now we're going to make some changes to the margins. Let's select from the margin category. Then we're going to set some custom margins, which can be found at the very bottom. For the custom margins, we are going to change the top margin to a 1 inch, the left to a 1.2, the gutter will be 0, the bottom is 1, and the right will also be 1.2. Select OK. Take a look how the text is now uh, indented 0.2 inches in. Sometimes you want to end a page before the point at which Word ends a page automatically and starts a new page called a soft page break. Soft page breaks occur when the maximum number of lines that can fit with on the current page size has been reached. You can also insert a manual page break or a hard page break. Let's position the insertion point at the left margin next to the subtitle, the allegories, near the bottom of page one. From here, we're going to insert a page break. Select insert from the ribbon bar. And in fact, if you're using 2013, the page breaks are under uh, the insert as well as 2010. So here's the page break feature. By selecting page break, notice how it takes the text and automatically places it down to the next page. Slide or scroll up and down so you can view your book report and then save. One of the most important practices in Microsoft Word is learning how to create a published document or a formal research paper, which is the next step of our assignments. This is the third file that you're going to be uploading to Inside NC. It's called Child Lit Book Report with your last name. 
The fourth and the last file is what we're getting ready to start, and this will be called your Coefficient Essay. On the top of page 202, we're going to learn how to format a formal research paper with a header and page numbers. We'll also learn about how to insert a reference and how to create a custom header and footer. Let's open up the file Coemission Essay from your data files. And we'll go ahead and resave this to have your last name at the end of the file. This is a five page essay that was written by a student and now we are ready to format it appropriately according to a specific writing style. Take a minute and scroll through the document to look at the different pages. Chances are you're going to have to submit a research paper or essay during the course of your education and it should be formatted to a specific style guide, set of rules for paper writing like MLA or APA. On page chapter 7, excuse me, on page 202 in chapter 7, there is a very nice table that discusses formatting and page layout guidelines for MLA and APA. It's very handy. It gives you the comparison of the two and gives you some information about how to get your document started. One of the most important elements of a formal research paper is to apply a header and a footer, which is text that appears at the top or the bottom of each page. Page numbers can also be added to the header or the footer of the document. Now that we have the file open and saved, we're ready to begin. I'll be starting on page 203 on step number three. Again, scroll up and down to review the formatting in the essay. Notice the paper size and the font margins have already been formatted. Let's position the insertion point at the beginning of the document and replace the text Tony McBride with your first and last name. The first four lines of this report are set up in MLA format for a first page. However, you need to add the page numbering for an MLA report. So from here, we'll apply a header and a footer. Let's select the header option under the insert ribbon at the top. From the header option, it gives you some pre-formulated styles which are never good to use for formal research. Instead, we're going to select the edit header option at the very bottom of the document. Here, we just have a location where we can type text. Let's press the tab key twice to move over to the right hand side of the document. Now that we have pressed the tab key twice, we are ready to type in the word page and number. And then we could apply a page number there. But for MLA, what they prefer that you do is type your last name. After you type your last name, be sure to press the space bar. Now we're going to insert a page number which can be found at the top left hand side of our header and footers tools. When you select the page number, it asks you where you where what position you want to place it at. We're going to select the current position and then also select the plain number. Let's select your last name and the page number in the heading pane. Let's also then go and change our font styles under the Home tab back to Times New Roman. And size 12. You can tap within the heading pane to deselect. Next, we'll close out the heading pane by either double-clicking below 
or selecting the red X or the close button under the header and footers tool design tab. If you scroll through the document, you'll notice that your name stays the same. The page number continues to change on each of the pages. Let's go back to the top of the document. Okay, now we're ready to get started with the citation part of our MLA document. First, let's go ahead and open up the References ribbon at the top of the document, and from here, let's make sure that the style is set to MLA. Notice that yours may be a little different than mine. I'm on the seventh edition, and you'll want to continually do those Windows updates so you get the most recent edition. We're going to select the MLA option and choose the most recent edition. Now we're going to begin by editing an existing citation. Let's position the insertion point within the um, J paragraph 12 citation at the end of the indented quotation. It's after the very first paragraph. All right, now we're ready to edit this citation. And if you move your mouse over the J paragraph 12, citation here, you'll notice that there's a gray box that appears. And if you right click on that gray box, we can select Edit Citation. So if it was supposed to be paragraph 9, we can change it right here to paragraph 9 and select OK. Let's also position the insertion point left of the period that ends the last sentence in the third paragraph that begins with according to a research state study done in Ohio. Which was the last sentence in the third paragraph. Right here. We're going to position our cursor at the very end, left of the period. All citations go with inside the period. We'll press the space bar so we can add a citation here. And we do not have this citation documented, so we're going to add a new citation. Up at the top, under Insert Citation, you'll see that there are three that have already been inserted into Microsoft Word but we don't have where this came from already included, so we're going to add a new source here. This is the Create Source dialog box, which is the most amazing thing in Microsoft Word, especially for students. Here, we get to choose what type of source we want to create. So if you choose the drop-down box, you'll notice there are many, many sources, uh, types of sources to choose from. If we select one, it'll give us some uh, pre-formatted options to choose from at the bottom, so it, the program knows what information we need from each of these. We're going to select a document from a website, but you may have to scroll down to locate it. The author's information is called Grabmeyer. And this information can be found on the bottom of page 204. Next, we're going to click on the name of the web page, and in here, we're going to type in the text that's listed on page 204. The name of the website. The year month, day, and then the year, month, and day that you accessed it. Once you have all of the fields filled in completely, go ahead and select OK. And you'll notice that now we have a new citation that appears at the end of the sentence. You'll also notice that it just has the uh, last name on here and not the actual page number. So we're going to add the page number. Let's go back and edit the citation. 
Now we can include pages 2 hyphen 3 and select OK. Now it formats it according to the MLA 7th edition standard. We don't have to worry about looking it up in the MLA textbook because the program knows where the parentheses, where the commas, and the periods need to go. From here, we're going to position the insertion point left of the period at the end of the indented quotation on page 2. Beginning with, in the past 25 years. Let's press the space bar before the period. Again, we're going to insert another citation and we'll add a new source. For this source, we're going to change it to a journal article. The information for this journal article will be found on page 205. Please take a moment and type in the information provided. You'll also want to select Show All Bibliography Fields so you can see all of the information that they're providing you. When you're completed with all of the information, select OK. We'll also want to edit the citation to include the page number of 432. Next, we're going to insert another citation by positioning the insertion point left of the period at the end of the quotation in the third paragraph that reads more than 40%. This is the quotation on page three that we need to cite. From here, we'll put our insertion point before the uh, period and press space we'll select the Insert Citation option. This citation also came from Popano, so we'll select Popano D, and that citation will be included. This citation came from page 480. Please save your document. Moving over to page 206, we'll now create a Works Cited page and use Word Views. Since we still have the file open, I'm going to go to the very end of the document and create a new blank line. Here we're going to insert a page break to create a, a new blank page. Now we're ready to add a bibliography that is a listing of all of the sources that we have used in our document. Select the References tab from the top and then select the Bibliography option. We're going to tap on the Bibliography button in the Citations and Bibliography group. You'll notice that the citations are automatically built into both of these styles. The Bibliography and the work cited has some blue text which is built on a style. We can easily make modifications to that. Let's select the work cited in the drop down list. And you'll see how the work cited automatically gets inserted uh, for us by formatting all of the citations that we've created. Because it has its own style, we really need to match it with MLA style. So let's go ahead and select all of the text on this page. 
we'll select the Home button and change our font to Times New Roman, size 12. We'll also change the line spacing to 2.0. I'll select the words Works Cited and change my font color to be automatic. So it'll put it back into a black font. Let's center the title. The default view for new documents is Print Layout View, which displays the document as it will appear when printed. There's also a Read More View, a Draft View, Web Layout, and Outline View, which can be found on the top of page 207. I'm going to go to the very top of my document by doing Control Home. Under View, you will find the different types of options that are available on the left-hand side. Please take a moment and go through each of the views to get familiar with them. Browse the document and look at the different pages that have been created. Moving over to page 208, we'll now insert and reply to comments. I'm still working on the essay, the formal research paper, and my cursor is positioned at the beginning of the document. We're going to select the word Canada at the end of the first paragraph of the document. To select it, simply double click on the word. Let's select the Review tab. We're going to add a comment under the Review tab in our document. Select New Comment. We're going to make a comment here on the right hand side and you'll notice whatever your program is registered to, it places the initials in the parentheses of the comment box. We're going to type in the text found on page 208, 208 which is the note. We'll also select in the 1960s, which is in the second sentence in the third paragraph. Here, we'll also insert a new comment. This comment is labeled with a number two as it's the second comment in the document. From here, we'll type in the comment listed on page 208. Then, tap or click inside the document so that way you can see the comments that you've added. Let's position the insertion point at the beginning of the subheading, Advantages of Coevision. Here, we want to put this on a new page. So let's insert a page break. Also, let's position the insertion point at the beginning of the subheading of disadvantages of cohibition and insert a page break. Let's go to the top of the document. If necessary, you can go ahead and select the Review tab. There are several ways you can view your document. Right now, we have the final showing the markup. The markup means the comments. You can also use the drop-down feature and select Final to remove the comments, or the original, or last, the original without the markup. Take a moment and go through each of those to get comfortable with the different views. Finally, we'll be choosing the No Markup option. Next, notice the two comments on page 1 can be removed by selecting the Final without the markup. Please take a look at page 209 to view the different types of markup styles. Let's go to the first comment box on page 1. So now we'll go ahead and select the markup option. In the first comment box, if you point or right click 
on the comment box, you do have some options including delete the comment. If you're using version 2013 of Microsoft Word, here's where you want to go in and reply to your comments and date them. In 2010, we do not have this option. If you are using 2013 of Microsoft Word, please continue on page 209 and complete the next four steps. Continuing on page 210, we're now going to create a resume and a cover letter. Before we get started, I'm going to save this document and close out. Now, we're going to create a new document. When we create a new document, we have some options to search for office.com templates as we did in Chapter 6. From here, we're going to select Resume Samples. If you have not used the Resume Samples before, it may state that it's out to be out of date and an Office update may be needed. That appears to be true on this machine. Therefore, I'm going back to the home and we'll select a resume in a different manner. Instead of choosing the resume samples, we'll select the one beside it, which is resumes and CVs. Here we have three folders under office.com called basic, job specific, and then last is situation specific resumes. Let's select the basic resume and you'll see a list of various types of resumes that you can use when creating your resume. They have us choose, the textbook has us choose an entry level from the category list. Select the entry level resume and select download. Here's the entry level resume on MicrosoftOffice.com. Here we have a list of references as well as information at the very top right hand corner. Because this resume only gives us the references and nothing further, we'll choose a different resume for this assignment. I'm going to go back to the file menu and select new. Again, we'll select the resumes and CVs then choose basic resumes. Choose a resume of your liking that you would like to use in the future. And download. When the resume loads, you'll be able to fill out the fields as suggested. Here's a simple resume that can be edited to include your own information. Please go through your resume and fill in the areas that ask you to describe career goals, address, city state, your name, so forth. Complete the, the fields in your resume and save. You'll upload your resume as the last file in the assignment set for Chapter 7. Thank you for joining me for Chapter 7, and I look forward to working with you in Microsoft Excel for Chapter 8.